What's up, everybody? Brant Phillips, Real Estate Fundamentals. I'm excited to share with you uh, a podcast interview that I did with my friend Gwalter, who's also, uh, Gwalter's also uh, a team member with me at eXp Realty. He is a hard-charging, uh, just action-taking real estate entrepreneur, so I think you're going to share a lot of, uh, I think you're going to receive a lot of insights on growing your bit, your real estate investing business, maybe working as an agent, wherever, whatever you're doing in the world of real estate. Uh, this is just a, a replay of an interview between myself and Galter. He interviews me, and I share just you know a little bit about my story what we're working on now we get into mobile home parks and cash flow and flipping and all kinds of stuff so i hope you enjoy this video if you like it we appreciate your subscribes and your likes of course and um i hope you enjoy yeah so you know and my wife and i started having our, our first child and now we have five but i had my first child <laughs> and, and uh just the the politics yeah, man, I like to flip houses and buy rentals. My wife's like, I want a bunch of kids. I'm like, all right. Um, I better well, we're going to need more house. rentals and houses <laughs> to yeah, justify. Yeah, more rentals, more <laughs> houses. Right, exactly. And uh, so, you know, how, how what kind of led to me getting into real estate was I'm like, what am I going to do? And grass is always green on the other side. So I went into the corporate world, had no desire to do it, but I'm like, well, I got to provide for my family. I went to that, that job. I remember the very first day I came home, my wife's like, Hey babe, how was it? You know, she's all excited. I've got this normal nine to five, yada, yada, yada. And I remember just like processing the question, how do I respond? What, you know, how was my day on the job? I'm like, I, I think I hate it actually. <laughs> but, <laughs> I was like, but don't worry, you know, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to provide for the family. But I remember telling her, I was like, I'm going to find something else. And um, it took me two years to kind of figure out what I wanted to do. You know, I would, I would look at something. I did like this little eBay business for a while and I looked at franchising and then I would stop looking. I'm it just kind of I was fighting off the resistance to just be complacent with the J-O-B, right? And, but I knew in my heart, like, this wasn't for me. And so I was very fortunate, you know, to find, you know, learn about real estate and Red Rich, that poured out all that kind of stuff. And the rest is history, so to speak. But, you know, when I got started, you know, my wife and I, we were uh, still fairly newlyweds, uh, been married a few years, and we had um just we both had we got married with debt with bad debt uh we didn't know any other kind of debt nice. and, uh, <laughs> you know like what is good debt yep. um and we well, we had student loans we thought that was good, good <laughs> it sounded good at the time <laughs> <laughs> oh god before kiyosaki came into our lives right so we had student loans we had credit cards all this kind of stuff so when i decided i wanted to become a real estate investor you know my wife's like you know, how are you going to do that? We don't have any money. We're living in an apartment, yada, yada, no business experience. So that, right. that was where I started, you know, literally broke. <laughs> <laughs> broke but just, I'll tell people I had a dream and a drive, you know, and people yeah. like, you know, and I get started in real estate. I'm like, dude, if you've got the dream and you've got the drive and you want to just kind of work your ass off and, and, and hustle and grind and uh, not quit when you hit, you know, setbacks and, and, and deals go sideways, then yeah. yeah, you can, if you're not willing to do that and probably no, you can't. Right. And that's, yep. that's consistent across just about any business. Yep. But real estate is a very specific business with a very long learning curve. Yep. And so I'm sure getting into it, it wasn't just slam dunk every single time. Uh, what was your first deal? What did it look like? And what were some of the things going through your head as you did it? Yeah. So, you know, I am very much, you know, entrepreneur ADD. Like I want to chase rabbits and squirrels and do all the stuff. Yeah. And, um, and I, I knew that about myself going into this, going into real estate. So <laughs> I, I told myself, and I was very, very dis disciplined year one where I told myself, I'm only going to do one thing. Pop. And there was a very, uh, very uh, influential networking group here in the Houston market. And they focus only on rental property, passive yep. income property, uh, single family houses and multifamily. Multifamily just wasn't even on my radar. So I'm like, they told me that I can buy single family homes and I did have good credit. That was the one thing I had working for me. So I focused just on single family houses. 
I told my wife, uh, said, I'm going to buy 10 rental properties this year. That was the, the, the that was basically how Toro was going to get into real estate. I'm like, hey, I'm going to buy 10 rental properties. <laughs> what? I don't know. <laughs> Bust out laughing at me, but I bought this white poster board, stuck it on our apartment wall, and I just I figured it out. Um, I, my first deal to answer a question was a wholesaler. Met a local wholesaler, and we became very, very good friends. Ended up buying 50, 60 houses from this guy over the years, and it was a single-family rental property. I used my credit card. Uh, I had to have some type of a down payment, earnest money. I used one of those credit card checks. Yep. So, Grand, um, closed on the deal. And I, my first rehab went really well. I did all the right things. Um, yeah. I mean, I had like a turnkey general contractor, vetted them out, and um, it went really well. And long story short, I was able to do 10 deals my first year while, you know, still working my job. And um, that was how I first first got into real estate. So that's crazy. So you, you actually start off the right way, um, use the credit card as a down payment. Uh, what was, where was this house? Was this in Houston where you live now, or was this a different community, different state? It was in Houston. It was in Houston. Yep. What, what was the price of the house? What did it look like? Uh, you know, it was around a $50,000 house. I think it was about wow. $45,000. Uh, we did $18,000 in rehab. And at that point in time, it was worth about $85,000 or so. Wow. And the it prices was, in Houston are? Yeah, cookie cutter, bread and butter deal. Now this was 13 yeah. years ago. That I I recently did a, a same uh, another deal on that same street just a few houses down recently about two and a half years ago, and I sold that one very minimal rehab. Uh, I forget what I bought it for around sixty. Um, did twenty or so in rehab, and we I did I sold that one with owner financing. I'm a big I love I love owner financing. Same here. Yep. That, that's why we buy property, right? So we can own or finance. Like that's the whole point. <laughs> do what the banks do, you know, I mean, I, I hold, I believe in holding, you know, for passive and, and for long-term wealth as, as things uh, appreciate, but I, I, I want a sustainable model. And I think a big way to we do that is, is diversify, right? Not diversify in stocks, bonds, it's like diversify. I'm a big believer in diversifying our, our real estate portfolio. Yeah. Uh, I have rentals. I still flip to this day. Um, I have my owner finance notes. I got my mobile home parks. Of course, what we're doing, you know, um, with the brokerage side of things at EXP as well, it's just another income stream with equity. So I'm a big believer in diversifying your real estate portfolio. You know what I love about you, Brant, is you, you, you're not blind to just rental property, not blind to just flips, not just wholesaling. You see the full picture of this. And, and more so than most people that I've had the conversation with, you see not just the end game, which is seller financing. You've been open enough to attach agency to it as well. And agency is a stream of income that really, even Than Merrill talks about it. Every real estate investor has the ability to add to their portfolio and then seller financing is that it's our end game. You know, <laughs> like you don't just want to end with rental property. You want to end with somebody else managing your rental property and you, you get paid. how did you come to that conclusion? Man, I got real burned out on my rentals. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the, the story with how I really found out about owner financing was I was work. I was walking to make ready with my contractors and I had several make readies that year in dude, they're, they're just depressing, you, you know? And so I went and met with my contractors and I'm looking at what the ten, tenant done. It, and it was nothing like, I've never had a horrible experience with tenants in terms of them just like destroying a property, but God, I've had some filthy people, man. You know, they trash carpets and the walls are all dirty. You know, $10,000 is not, not, you know, I've done that multiple times. So like we got to paint everything. We've got to do carpet, yada, yada, yada. And you drop 10 grand, there goes two or three years of cash flow right there, right? You know, on some of my, some of my properties, and so I was walking it with my uh, my contractors, and I'm like, damn, you know, kind of like frustrated. And uh, I made I made some kind of comment, you know, my my painter who said something I don't remember what it was. This was seven eight years ago, and he's like he's like well this he's like this is gonna be a nice house, you know, don't worry. I'm like. Well, you know, if you like it so much, why don't you buy it? And he's like, can I do that? You know, I was like, 
figured that out and I found a, a, an attorney who specialized in seller financing, drew up the docs, boom, he traded a little sweat equity. I yep. bought the paint carpet. He did all the rest. He is still set. He still is, uh, owns that property to this day. He is not refinanced out. Um, I did the same thing. I did two that year. I did two the next year. Dude, if we got time, I'll tell you a story about how yeah. all this came into play. So I've owner financed four houses over a two year period and uh, three out of four just to my, my contractors. Uh, and I still have all those notes today with the exceptional one, one actually refinance. I've only had it two ever refinance. So I did that a couple of times and I was like, all right, this got me out of a crunch. I'm it's passive. Now I have a third party escrow company. Things are going great. Uh, the next year, I did a couple more times and I had this property that was a, it was $350,000 and around 2011, 2012 for me, that's kind of, that's, you know, that's much higher than our median price housing here. Oh yeah. And, and it wouldn't sell. And I told my agent, I said, Hey, go ahead and put it out with owner financing, see what we get. And uh, right away we got a full price offer, $70,000, uh, down payment. Now that doesn't happen every time, but it happened this. So I used 70 K to pay off, uh, reduce the, what I owed my private lender. So I was, uh, had a note essentially with, with my buyer for 270,000, eight and a half percent interest. And I owe my private lender 7% at $210,000. So it was a really nice cash flow. And I did a couple more deals like that. And uh, so this is probably about year four. I had about 10 owner finance uh, properties. And uh, this, is, this is kind of a humbling story to share with you. That I'm going to share with you, but I'm going to share it. So my wife and I are sitting down end of the year. And my wife is not very active in the business. And we've got five kids, right? Um, we, we say we do workshops together. I work, she shops, you know how it works. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so we're sitting down, but my wife is is very um she is uh uh like motivational from like very supportive, encourages me. I'd say naively encourage me sometimes, like well, I think I'm gonna do this. She's like, You can do it, I believe in you. I'm like, you do because I'm things good idea. And uh I married a you know, I know you're East Coast, I married a Philly girl, so she's she's from the streets of Philly, so she's got a little got a little street, little edge to her too, you know. Nope. And, and so we're sitting down and reviewing like, Hey, here's, here's what business did this year and setting next year's goals. So I was like, all right, here's our rental portfolio. Here's what that looks like. Here's uh, here's how many flips that we did. You know, here's my, like my coaching business and what that did this year. And I'm like, you know, and kind of like, Oh, by the way, here's these owner finance deals. And I just kind of uh, glossed over it going to the next thing. And she's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. She's like, uh, how does that work? She's like, I don't think you've ever explained that to me. How does, how does the owner financing work? And I was like, well, let me try to explain this to you. Um, and I explained to her, it's like, you know, the rentals that we have, right? Well, it's kind of like that. And I'm like what I did with a lot of my rentals, I just converted them to owner finance. And I'm like, so the, how it explains, it's a little bit like a rental because I get cash flow. Like, you know, it's, it's very passive. I'm like, matter of fact, they don't call me for repairs. I've got a third party escrow company that handles everything, the payments. I just get ACH every month. I'm like, but it's a little bit like a flip because I get some cash too on the size, you know, on their down payment. And it's, I'm like, it's just like, I'm like, honestly, these people I've sold these houses to, they haven't, I don't even know some of them. And uh, I get money every month. Like I haven't missed a payment, you know, late fees, everything. Right. Anyways, let's talk about this. She's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why don't you just do that? <laughs> <laughs> Yep. I, was like, I was like that's a good question so i uh, have you do you know you've probably heard of mitch steven right yeah yeah so i reached out to i didn't know him but i reached out to mitch and uh went and met with mitch we went on vacate like uh he did like a real estate investor vacation and i was like all right so i just got more focused on it i've just been very hesitant you know to put all my eggs in one real estate basket right and um, but I, I do believe in diversifying, you know, like when this whole COVID thing came out, you know, you know, I've got a lot of rentals and I was like, not sure what that was going to look like. And I got I know. Very, you know, nervous. Right. Yep. And it's 
it's all going well, but I, you know, I had, all right, I still have my owner finance deals. They, they just got to pay, um, yeah. you know, they don't have to, but anyways, I just felt very well insulated. So. Yeah, I like that. And it's, um, it's part of the, the business diversity, diversification. I believe in it as long as it's within real estate. I don't like the concept of, wow, look at the size of that water bottle, man. <laughs> That's how they drink water in Houston. They have like the three liter water bottle. It's bigger in Texas, man. Yeah. That's awesome. And, and diversity, like people say, oh, you know, should I diversify? And to me, I say absolutely not in the yeah. beginning of your business anyway, right? Like go and just make some money. Then you diversify to protect, right? But you've actually found a way to diversify and increase income. We, we call it alchemy, right? You've found a way to actually turn every single step of the deal into a, a source of income where where did you realize you were doing that like at what point did you realize oh my god i'm doing a deal i'm no longer just getting paid when i sell the property later on well i'm still learning <laughs> <laughs> i'm still learning and i i'm a big believer you know like yourself and just continually learning and growing um i learn something new almost every day in real estate and um one, you know, some that I learned from Stephen Covey was just, you know, continually uh, sharpen the stall, the saw, right? Yep. And um, so I don't think it's, I don't think you're going to be very successful in real estate if you add a new strategy to your arsenal every single month. Um, but every year to two years, I think you need to take a look at other investment opportunities and, and that's kind of just what I've done where I, I got laser beam with rentals. I had about 25 rentals. And um, when I quit my job and I was like, all right, um, I get it. And this is why I teach my students. It's like, look, you know, what you need to do is kind of put the, the blinders on, focus on one thing until, until you have enough data experience and you assess it like, hey, is this working? Is it not working? Is it sustainable? Is it something I want to keep doing? And, and you basically become, you know, I don't, I guess I'll use the, the word expert, like where you get really, really good at something where you can automate it, systematize it, train your team to do it. And then you add on another income stream, another investment uh, type of deal. And that's what I did. I started with rentals and then, uh, you know, I realized, hey, these are going to be great for my long-term wealth, but One they're not. Yeah, they're not paying the bills. And that's, you know, we know where I was buying highly leveraged uh, rental properties that were you know, one to $300 a month. And so I learned, I kind of got uh, misled a little bit, to be honest with you, my first mentor, I'm like, hey, appreciate the hell of a guy out of the guy because he's helped me create wealth. But I'm going to I'm going to treat my rental property for what it is long term wealth creation. Uh, so I decided, hey, I'm not going to live off of these rental properties uh, and I'm going to find active income, right? There's active and there's passive. And I don't care who you are in real estate. Everyone's you're working for some active income of some sort, right? Yeah. So um, I, I was watching those, you know, how to flip a house shows and uh, Armando Montalongo and yep. Merrill. And, the, and uh, I'm like, all right, I got to try this. And um, tried it, lost money on my first deal. It was horrible and almost didn't do it again. I was like, all right, rentals in my comfort zone. I'm just going to go back to that. And uh, my second house that I flipped, we made, uh, I made over $60,000 in 60 days exactly. Wow. And uh, I was like, I was on the juice, man. I was hooked. And uh, so I focused on that for a few years and then uh, people started asking me to speak and teach and coach. So I started doing that and that kind of layered that on then the owner financing thing. Uh, and that, so it's just been like, it's been layers every yeah. one to two years. I'd be like, huh, you know, I'm, I'll meet somebody. I'm like, they seem really smart. They seem successful. Let me, you know, get some mentorship. Let me talk to them. And I remember, Two years ago, I was a, in a mastermind and these guys that I, that I was mastermind with, they have a similar business there in California. They were doing about 40 to 50 uh, investment deals a year. But they, they mentioned that 
they started, um, you know, things were shifting years ago from a buyer's market to a seller's market. And they started saying, hey, we're noticing we're not converting as many of our motivated seller leads to, to accept a cash offer. Uh, so there's pretty sharp dudes. So they had basically began just interweaving that conversation about, hey, we understand you may not want a cash offer. Uh, would you like to talk about listing your property? So they had uh, exceeded the amount of listings that they were doing off their motivated seller leads to where they're buying 40 to 50 investment deals a year, but they were listing, they listed 65 houses that previous year. Right. And I was like kicking myself under the table because <laughs> we were not even having that conversation. And I had actually deactivated my, my real estate license about a year and a half before that, even though I had been licensed for eight, nine years, I deactivated it because I had a full-time agent on staff. I wasn't using it. Uh, it wasn't creating wealth, wasn't creating passive income. So I was like, I don't, I don't need this. Um, so I heard that conversation. I was like, we have to start monetizing our leads. And then around within a few weeks later, I met Connor Steinbrook for the first time, you know, and I was like, all right, if that's not, you know, God or the universe or whatever speaking to me, like I need to, I need to get focus on this. So that's, we've added, you know, later on the, the realty side of things as well. I'm working with agents. Yeah. And since we're, we're talking about it, uh, Connor Steinbrook is somebody I just interviewed this week as well. And uh, he speaks highly of you, Brant, and what you've created. And, you know, for him, he's got this massive team of real estate agents, 400 people under him who are out there transacting every day. And I think he came to the same conclusion. You came to the same conclusion I came to is, because I was an agent, I was a licensed agent. I was going on hundred appointments a year, doing a lot of it for other investors. And every so often I take a deal for myself. And I started realizing every 10 appointments, I was getting a deal for me. Every three appointments was a listing. So just by maintaining that listing, you know, you're, you're getting three times as much or two times more than what you'd get. And it, it eventually adds up to a deal, right? <laughs> you keep doing that. You know, 10 of those listings adds up to what a deal would have been. And so uh, it became this awareness that there's more out there. And when I, I've done the same thing as you got, came so close to getting rid of my license, but instead built a team. So shifted all the work over. So automated it. And yeah. that becomes, it's what you said earlier, you learn it, you do it, and then you, you teach it to somebody else. You delegate, you get really good at it and you, you become the expert and you teach it to somebody else. Yeah. And so that's, that's how you create multiple streams of income. You didn't do it overnight. You built it a couple of years at a time, focusing hard on one thing and then focusing hard on the next thing and the next thing. And what's cool with, with Connor in our interview, I found that uh, speed was really his strength. He talks about speed all the time, speed of uh, acquisition, speed of disposition, uh, speed of uh, action and idea and speed of implementation and speed was his thing. And it, just from a few minutes of talking to you already, I think that actual focus is your thing. Your, your ability to focus is what gives you strength. Um, so speaking about focusing, you, you got really focused on lenders. How did you come up with the idea to write the private lender playbook? Because this book is like, I've, I've not finished it, but going through it, I feel like it's, a, it's like an encyclopedia of exactly what you can do to make somebody either more comfortable or to make sure that you're doing the deal the right way so you're not in any way disadvantaged when you're financing deals how did what made you decide you were going to teach this and, and write a book on it yeah well you know just like you're saying agree with everything you said about, about connor and connor connor is speed 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 even the way he talks I'm like, connor, you got to talk slower man i'm like kind of you know slow texas guy here um but connor's great and he's awesome he's taught me a lot um since we've been working together um uh, yeah so with the book so many years ago, uh, it's probably going back, gosh, eight, nine years now, at least, um, you know, I started speaking, a friend of mine, you know, invited me to do a, a, a boot camp, uh, a workshop, whatever you want to call it, like a two day kind of thing years ago. And I'm like, dude, I don't think anybody wants to listen to me. <laughs> you know, I had not done that much. Imposter and, syndrome. <laughs> yeah, you know, he, man, like I had a great time just, I, and I'm, I'm a really, I'm a quiet guy. I'm pretty, I was a very shy kid growing up and, and reserved and um, and, you know, we did, we did that that workshop and I was almost sometimes feel more comfortable on a stage than I do like, you know, in small, uh, you know, environments. It's kind of strange. But um, 
So I spoke that week. And I was like, man, this was great. Like I loved it. I had, I had fun, made a little bit of money. I was like, that was just icing on the cake. And then I started getting asked to speak more and do little events and uh, really enjoyed it. So I got this idea uh, to write a book. So I wrote a book. It was called How to Flip a House. And part of it was I just wrote it because I was getting busy. Guys were asking me, hey, look, can we do breakfast? Can we do lunch? There just comes a point in time where I can't do any more breakfast or lunches, right? Like I got to just focus on my business and my family. So it just is kind of fun. Uh, I wrote that first book. It took me like three years and it was uh, not a lot of fun to be honest, but I'm like, all right, I got a book done, published author. Cool. Mark that off the kind of the bucket list kind of thing. And anytime anyone asks me, hey, uh, can you help me do it? You do I'm like, yep, read my book. And I started using it like that where I could kind of screen people, see if they're serious or not. Because if someone asked me, hey, can, can you help me? I'm like, yep, read my book and then give me a call. Very, very, very small percentage of people, right? Actually call you back. Hey, I read your book. But every time that I say, read my book, call me back. Every time that someone has done that, dude, I help them, coach them, mentor them, whatever I can do. So right. that was, but what happened with private money was I began raising private money uh, in 2009, uh, the very first year that I went into uh, and went full time into real estate. And um, 2009, I was still, what, what a hell of a time to jump in. <laughs> uh, my job, yeah. My dad, you know, worked, you know, a uh, corporate job, so to speak, his entire life. And he's like, you know, what the hell are you doing? Quitting your job. It was like a fortune 500 company and uh, all this kind of stuff. He, he thought I was crazy. And I'm like, you know, I love my dad, but at the same time, I'm thinking, dad, I've seen you get laid off at least a dozen times over the years. You know, we lost our house, foreclosure, bankruptcy, all that kind of stuff. I, that's what I saw my parents go through. And so I was like, yeah, I think I'll go ahead and try this real estate thing out. Um <laughs> But so that's when I went full time and, you know, so I started going to, uh, you know, just different networking events, uh, self-directed. We have a very uh, uh, influential uh, self-directed uh, third party uh, company that helps people invest their self-directed IRAs. And they're they're very active in doing workshops and stuff like that. So I began raising some money from there, but I saw some stuff where. One, there was just a massive opportunity, uh, meaning there's a ton of money out there and real, you know, private mortgage lending. Most people don't know about it. Right. Um, financial advisors, they're not pitching it because they're not making money from it. The bank sure as hell don't want people to know about it. You know, right. Wall Street's talking about it. So I saw a big opportunity um, and, and and a big opportunity and, and really very little awareness. Right. So when I go into these networking events, they'd open them up, you know, how, Hey, if you have a deal, you want to come up, try to wholesale a deal, raise money. And I'd see these guys go up and dude, they would violate every kind of, you know, <laughs> philosophy. And they get up there with like a sheet of paper and they're like, I got a deal, you know, just reeking of desperation. And like, I need to close tomorrow, you know, and I need yeah. this amount of money. And, you know, I think I'm going to flip it. Maybe I'm going to rent it. I don't really know. It just, a lot of uncertainty, uh, desperation, and it was just, and I was, wasn't that kind of guy. So my right. philosophy ended up just, you know, hey, here's what we do. If you're interested in learning more, come talk to me. And, um, and that worked pretty well, but, you know, I'm just a big lead with value guy. And the more that, you know, I, I learned about, you know, who my avatar was from a private lender, you know, got to know them a little bit. The biggest thing is fear. Like on uh, fear of, you know, um, investing in something that they don't understand, investing with someone maybe that they don't know. How does it all work? You know, just all those. Uh, they had all these questions. And yeah. I ran the same thing with, you know, fledgling real estate investors like, hey, I don't have time to go meet with all these people. And so I just took the time. Out. I was like, you know, what? I'm going to write a book and I'm gonna explain it all out because the more that people are educated and understand something, fear subsides, trust increases. So uh, I took the time, wrote a book. I was like, I want to answer all the questions, show them the, the you know, the, the pitfalls, things to avoid, how to treat investors. I did not make one, you know, pitch 
for anyone to invest with me, you know, obviously they know how to get in touch with me, but um, it was, that was it, man. Just lead with value and truly just, just take that approach to private money. So that was really it. Cause you know, both we don't, nobody makes money from books. Um, no. But Max and I were talking, I was like, all right, Oprah Winfrey, Joel Osteen, and um, you know, that's about it. That's about all makes money. <laughs> makes yeah. Money. I mean, if, if Dwayne Johnson goes and writes a book, I'll read it. You know, <laughs> it's all about attention and influence and the more you have. Um, but yeah. you know, like we talk about books, I wrote this as a lead gen. It's the same thing. Like if you want to work with me, read the book first, this saves me three hours, right? You know, all about me, you know, my process, what I did and yours is a little longer. I'm, I'm assuming this is closer to a five or a six hour book. Yeah. And so time and so it is on it's on audible also oh thank god did you read it oh yeah but wow. no oh dude no no way am i yeah, i did <laughs> my first book i had i put on audible and um i i i did the first chapter dude it was brutal so uh i found a i found a whatever you call them and a narrator and he he read the book and he read the second book as well. Nice. All right. So I'm looking forward to uh, listening to your first. Did you put the first chapter out there or do you have a little forward at all? I did. Yeah, I give the forward and then I hand it over to my man, Randy Haynes, who, which was funny because he was a radio DJ in, in Houston. And I grew up listening to this guy. Uh, my mom's friend used to drive us to school. She always listened to this guy and uh, called a local, like the closest recording studio and it was Randy. So, uh, yeah, so Randy narrated it. That's wild. So that, that's cool. You get to work with one of your heroes. He makes you sound great. So now I'm even more interested. I, I love the audio version of books like this. Uh, once it gets to a certain thickness and this, this has that gauge, this is audio <laughs> approved for me. So <laughs> I love it. And I love your, your story of how you got to it. You saw a problem in the marketplace. You said, you know what, I'm going to serve the need. Um, you didn't pitch anything, but what you did is you put your name on there. You put a contact uh, information for yourself. And one thing you you hinted at earlier, I don't know if you noticed this, but you're talking about uh, wrapping around the mortgage, right? A wraparound mortgage that you did. And you hinted that the, the private money, the, the lender you were borrowing from was at 7% interest. Now, I've I've raised private capital. You know, I've raised uh, about 1.6 million in private capital, but... I wasn't paying seven. <laughs> I guess some of that at 12 and two, you know? <laughs> well, that's what I used to borrow at. You know, I started 12 and two even more and it was, it was basically hard money. And over the years, we've, we've stepped that down. We've stepped that down. Part of it's been the market. And then part of it, um, you know, is just been, that's the conversations that we have. We've created a good little amount of demand, um, you know, that particular deal, I had a lender that was loaning to us at 7% for seven years. Wow. Only. Yeah. And they allow, allowed us to wrap it. And, um, you know, so what, what I say a lot when I speak about private money is you can often tell uh, the experience of the borrower about what they pay for their money. And I'm, a, I'm doing some private lending now. We did about private, uh, 25 uh, loans last year. Wow. I loan 12 and two, you know, and sometimes higher. But I say that you can tell the experience of the borrower by what they pay for their money. So newer investors, a lot of times will pay 12, 14, 15 percent, pay two or three points um, because of their lack of experience. And they if their numbers still work, their numbers still work. And that's what I used to pay. But I, what I teach private lenders is, you know, is that, hey, there if you want to go for 12, 14, 15 percent rates, go for it. But understand there's a trade off in the risk return. And yep. so what we do now is, you know, so over the years we've built, you know, our database of private lenders. And when we have a deal, we don't say, Hey, we're looking for 7%. We just say, here's an opportunity, reply back with your rates and terms. And we, I guess you'd say, let them kind of bid against each other a little bit. And after a, you know, lender replies back at, you know, 10%, 9%, 8%, if they hear no, 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 they may say, I just want to get my money work and I want it to invest with you. Right. Uh, you know, so that's how we've done that. And I, one of the very first, um, this was way back in the day and it really was like, I can't, my, my jaw dropped. I couldn't believe it happened. 
but old business partner of mine and I, and he taught me so much of what I know when it comes to real estate and, and private money. He's not in real estate anymore. He never really liked real estate. He was a marketer. Uh, so I did all the boots on the ground stuff and he was just a marketer and kind of mentor to me. We met with the private lender and we have, you know, this PowerPoint presentation, went through all the slides, explained to her how it worked. And um, it's kind of, you know, one of the rules of negotiating sales is, you know, whoever says the first number first, whatever loses kind of thing. Right. And, you know, talking about those guys that I'm seeing and they're out pitching a deal saying, hey, we'll pay 12 percent. Well, you know, all right. Pay me 12 percent. Well, I found, you know, whenever I mentioned a number first, especially when I was borrowing 12 percent, there's some people just didn't even trust you if they didn't know about private lending and they're like, Hmm, this sounds a little too good to be true. So we met with this, uh, this lender went through all, you know, the presentation and she's like, well, that looks pretty good. I think I understand it. I I like you guys. You seem pretty trustworthy. So how, how much money can I make, you know, with this thing? And my friend responded and he said, well, it depends. She's like, what does it depend on? He's like, it depends on, you know, what, rate of return would you be happy with you know it kind of gave her we look for win-win deals what rate of return would you be happy with and she said you know i think i'm making like one percent on my savings account or whatever it was so i'd probably be happy with five percent that's when you just say nothing you're like and and my friend my friend's response was classic i remember to this day because we're born at 10 and 12 percent all day long back then and he said you know um that's not the number that we had in mind, but I think we can work with that. <laughs> <laughs> he was honest the whole time. I love it. <laughs> I've used that line so many. You make it. You make an offer on a house, or I mean, when you're talking to a seller, say what you know. It this doesn't happen a high percentage of the time, but a low percentage of the time, they'll give you your number for. They'll give you their number first. It's much cheaper than you thought you could ever buy that property for. You don't, you don't like choke or say, go, oh, you know, woo-hoo. Say, that's not the number that I had in mind, but I think we can work with that. You're, <laughs> in, you're, you're in integrity saying that, making that statement. <laughs> I love that. I love staying in integrity when we're in an appointment uh, and holding our cool at the same time. Uh, so, Brad, that's, that's phenomenal. That may be a future book. Uh, the brand phillips book of negotiations uh, it's not the number that we had in mind but we might be able to make it work (laughs) i love that so so brent where where are you going now where do you see your future uh it's you know we just came out of covid um i know i personally made some changes on my portfolio i was selling some stuff off prior to covid um now you know during covid i said uh you know i'm not sure what i'm gonna do i'm just gonna hold and now I think we're, we're coming towards the end of it. And I've come up with this strategy of I'm going to sell some of my condos to buy some bigger buildings and, and run with multifamilies and mixed use. Where, where do you see us going? And I know this is 100% speculative, um, but we, we do speculate on some level in this business. Yeah. Where do you see it going? What is your strategy right now? 100% affordable housing, uh, 100% affordable rentals, affordable housing with owner finance. And, you know, going back to that every couple of years, adding a layer on or a different strategy on, uh, I got introduced to mobile homes, mobile home parks and mobile home on mobile homes on land, um, you know, several years ago. And a friend of mine was doing really well with it. And I wasn't really paying attention to them. And then I really stopped and looked at it and learned that Sam Zales, the number one, uh, his company owns the, mo- the number one owner of mobile home parks in the U.S. Warren Buffett owns Clayton Homes, also owns 21st Century Mortgage, the largest financier of, oh, mobile, wow. home, of mobile homes. So I was like, there's something to this. Sam so, Zell. Yeah, I mean, you're just listing billionaires, dude. All right. <laughs> he's a beast. And, and so I started looking into a couple of years ago. Last year, we bought our first mobile home park and we bought our first RV park. Today, I'm excited. We're closing on a 51 lot subdivision. That's uh, it's basically gonna. Right now, there's uh, about six single family homes out there, and there's about 10 or so mobile homes and a few RVs that we're gonna remove, and we're gonna make it affordable housing community, and uh, 100% on that. When I what really, you know, there's just so much data information where that I, I was 
really beginning to get excited about like the mobile home park model, especially when I heard Sam Zell talk about it. I was like, yeah, dude, it's like, it was a no brainer for me not to at least, you know, explore, do a few deals. But the funny thing with Sam Zell is, you know, this dude has owned, you know, been the number one owner of like commercial buildings, skyscrapers, freaking malls, uh, apartments. So he has sold off. I've been told he sold off about 50% of his uh, multifamily and his retail commercial type stuff. Um, he's, he sold off about half of it and he's kept wow. half. I've been told he has never sold a mobile home park. Yeah. Since the eighties. And so you start reading all this and then also there's much less competition. Um, so that's where I'm at. Um, but I'm a big believer of affordable housing, whether that be, you know, in, in development and in rentals and multifamily. And, and for me, like that's kind of, I'm going down the rabbit hole with uh, the mobile home manufactured homes right now. I love that brand that that future that you're painting. Uh, me and my business partner, we sit down and we, we say, you know, where's the world going? You know, how can we help? What, what need can we survive? Uh, not survive, but uh, provide for. And what can we uh, do to expand our business? And one of the things we've been, it's a wall we've been hitting, and I think you just solved it for me. Uh, this wall we've been hitting, we're saying, well, inflation is about to crush a lot of people in America. We know, and it's gonna, it's gonna pummel the economy. Middle class is gone. Uh, they don't know it yet. They don't even know it yet. You know, a year or two from now, um, they're about to get destroyed. And, um, you know, what can we do to help, right? Or do, do we cut our units in half the size so we can still maintain our rents and our mortgages? Uh, provide cheaper housing like what do we do and i think what you just said i think the mobile home parks i think we're going to see people going to those those smaller houses those mini houses and and creating communities where it's all about hey you know what? it's more about lifestyle and less about um the house you have and just being able to have a place to sleep and shower and eat but then use the world as your your playground is, yeah. is that do you agree with that assessment a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And then the cool thing too, with, with the, the, whole, let's, let's just be honest here. The mobile, the word or the phrase mobile home park does not have a positive stigma to it. Not even close. <laughs> whatsoever. Um, it just, it just doesn't. So the first two parks that we bought, you know, they, they didn't help the stereotype out. I'll just put it like <laughs> when we bought them. But, you know, that's been our attitude since we've come in is like, hey, no, we're not going to put up with some of the stuff uh, that the stereotypes. Right. And um, and so we have very clean communities. We've invested a lot of money fixing the roads, signage, lighting, getting out the, the bad guys, you know, the, you know, the drug dealers and all that kind of stuff. And it's been a lot of work, but it's. So, uh, you know, there's a, one of our communities, it's called Pine Ridge. You can go on Facebook, Pine Ridge, uh, AHC, which stands for Affordable Housing Community. This weekend, we just put in a park. Like we got picnic benches, a grill, a little tether ball for the kids. We're adding swings, swing set, uh, slides. Dude, we're, it's, it's a great place. You know, it is, it is, it is a very, you know, safe environment. It's surrounded by all these trees. And the people are like raving about it, you know, so it's, it's been a lot of fun where, hey, man, let's, let's face it, there's, there's lower income, poor folks, whatever you want to call it, and there's gonna, whether the economy is doing great, or whenever we're, we're in a recession, like we're officially now into a recession, there's gonna be poor folks, it doesn't mean that they have to live like a third world country, I mean, we're still in the United States, let's give them clean functional safe affordable housing and um dude it's it's been um it's been a lot of fun and it's challenging like we walked our property yesterday that we're closing on today and you talk about a place that has just been it's slumlord man it's been slumlord and this the seller um i think he's friends with me on facebook dude like not knocking the <laughs> but is like he inherited it and they've done nothing to it. And we met with our, our contractor yesterday to do the road work. Yeah. And it's like, you know, a hundred grand worth of road work has to be done. Yeah. Potholes like this deep. <laughs> to, you know, it's just a one straight shot road. And I asked the contractor and I was like, dude, have you ever seen a road this bad before? And I'm expecting him to say, yeah, it's not that bad. He's like, 
dude, no, I've never <laughs> seen this bad in my life. <laughs> this is, uh, Brent, this is as bad as they get. <laughs> I need potholes on the potholes. <laughs> dude, it's so bad. <laughs> So we have, we have a work cut out for us, but we've already got message. We met with a lot of people just kind of walking the street yesterday and talking to people. And there's a lot of people excited. Um, they're excited, you know, just, just to get the roads done, dude, the trash, the trash company will no, no longer go down the road. So people is so bad. Like they are just, there's trash like out in front of people's yards. Cause they haven't burned it yet. Or they're just too lazy to burn it. Um, the the mail delivery will not go down the road ambulance is uh, an ambulance got stuck uh, ambulances will not respond down the road anymore uh amazon forget about it you yeah. know so people are excited just oh my god you're gonna do the road work well yeah we're gonna do the road we're gonna do lighting we're doing cleanup we're doing this and this and that they're you know, you know there's it's it's fun man there's a lot of opportunity there because you know, it's mom. You know, if you're buying an apartment complex, you know, you're probably buying it from uh, someone who's got a decent amount of real estate education, uh, maybe another very experienced investor. Uh, we're buying these things from mom and pops for the most part, yep. you know, and so that that means there's a lot of opportunity for us. <laughs> Brent, you, you've got me interested. I'm going to start looking at the mobile parks in my neighborhood. <laughs> There's not too many of them up here, but I'm, I'm hunting now. I'm going to see what's in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, see what we got. Maybe uh, Connecticut has some. Pennsylvania is a good market. Yep. I'm going to look at a Pennsylvania now. <laughs> yeah, Brent, uh, what an amazing interview, man. I, I feel like I just barely like scratched the surface of the person you are and, and the knowledge you have in your head. And uh, I, I definitely, I know we're gonna have to do this again at some point in the future, uh, but I just want to thank you for coming on, uh, spending your time with us, giving us so much value. Um, right before you go, I always, at the end of our podcast, I like to ask, uh, what are the three things that you would go back? If you go back to 20 year old Brant and just say, Hey, this is, you know, if you learn this or do this or have this principle or skill in your life, this would improve your life. What three things would you go back and give yourself for information? Okay. So, um, sometimes I'm a slow thinker, so, uh, I'll make sure I answer this right. So if I was going back 20 years ago, um, I'll mention Stephen Covey again, put first things first. Yep. So I would begin with the end in mind where I fell into a trap of, you know, pursuing wealth and money. And for um, a period of my life, I damn near lost it all, meaning my relationship with my wife was not a good father, health, uh, my health was not good. So first things first, right? Begin with that uh, because our, our health, our relationships are so much more important uh, than money. Um, number two, number two, I, you know, clarity is so important. And I, you know, I really didn't figure out what I wanted to, to do uh, until I was, you know, in my early 30s. And, and so I'm very glad I found that, that focus then, but I would love to ha have had that focus uh, in my 20s about and just, oh, yeah. you know, you know, just begin to think bigger and dream bigger, because I just in my 20s was like, as you know being super successful and creating a company and being a real estate investor that wasn't even on my radar i just didn't think that was for me you know i was humbling beginnings that was it um and then so the focus would be the second thing and, and it would have been on real estate and third you know it's all for not if we're not helping people and building a legacy as well so just incorporating that earlier and sooner i mean i don't care where you're at for people who are just getting started you know if you've done one deal help someone who's done no deals you know if you've done 10 help somebody out and just just teach and lead from where you're at you know and commit to continually evolve and grow and expand and just keep doing it just keep doing it yeah brent those are three solid pieces of advice i i appreciate it so much um I have found those all to be aspects that if I knew them earlier on, if I, if I can meet Brant Phillips when I was 20 years old and you drop those three nuggets on me, I probably, I don't even think I would have appreciated or understood them when I was 20. Um, but if it was like on a clay tablet, like a rich man of Babylon, right? You just dropped it on a clay tablet. <laughs> <laughs> like, it would have helped me in my journey. So <laughs> yeah, 
like my kids, man. Like I don't think they they're not they're not picking up anything right now, but that's okay. I know they are, even though they don't realize it. But yeah, I get it. It's all in osmosis. You're, you're dropping yep. it in. Uh, so, Brant, what's the easiest way for somebody to get in touch with you to learn more about you, uh, to jump into your uh, coaching program, or, or find out some of the things you're doing? What's the easiest way for people to get in contact with you? BrantPhillips.com. Keep it simple. Nice. I love it. You're, you know what? Uh, BrantPhillips.com. Focus. One thing. This is what I do. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much, Brant. I appreciate your time, man. I uh, appreciate your energy, your, your giving personality. Um, you have just, you've really opened my mind and I know that there's people listening right now. You're on Facebook live, but I'll add this to the podcast later on. Uh, you've, you really inspired me and I, I know that I'm, I'm blessed and thankful to be a part of uh, the EXP team and, and in your downline. So thank you so much for your time, brother. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I appreciate you. Can't wait to meet in person, man. As soon as, uh, things open up up there, I told Max, man, let's book a flight, man. Let's come work together. Meet, I'm excited to meet your team and, uh, man greater things yet to come my friend this is just the beginning brand thank you so much man i will see you soon hey when you have a choice always work with the best